for a number of years and joined our World Cup squads for four World Cups, right, Jamie? Uh, yep. Yeah. Hi, Nathan. Thank you very much. Good. So uh, my name is Nathan Abdelnour. I'll be moderating today. For those of you who are new to the webinar series, um, what uh, you have on your control panel is a bit of a text box. Some of you have already started to raise your hands, which is great. Unfortunately, we won't be unmuting people to ask questions at this time. Um, but you do have a questions box. So what I'll do is I'll let Jamie run through his presentation and then I will kind of moderate questions. Uh, and instead of calling on individual questions, what we'll do is kind of group them as, as we go based on the themes of what Jamie's discussion will lead us down towards. Uh, Jamie will do a quick other little bit of history introduction and give us some context as to the basis of tonight's presentation. And then uh, we'll go from there. So we've got about an hour. So Jamie, over to you, my friend. All right, thank you, Nathan. Um, hello, everybody. Um, as thanks for the in introduction. Um, obviously, Jamie Cudmore. Um, I now uh, have the pleasure to have moved back to Canada this summer uh, with my family and uh, um, taken up the position with uh, Rugby Canada um, as the uh, head coach of the Pacific Pride with uh, with Adam Kleberger, and uh, also will be assisting um, with Kingsley Jones with the uh, senior men's national team in uh, the summer. Well, unfortunately, probably not this summer, but um, you know, in the future, as soon as uh, we get past this pandemic uh, and uh, get into some uh, some international rugby. Um, in a little um, little bit of history for myself, I was very fortunate to have played, um, you know, in Canada, in uh, in New Zealand, Wales, and then did most of my professional career in France, where I also coached throughout those times. Um, I haven't come uh, recently to coaching. I've coached way back in the day with with Tim Murdy at Rockridge uh, and uh, with Bob Remmer working uh, at the Rockridge School while playing for Capilanos. Used to do mini rugby when I was in New Zealand, uh, high school rugby uh, in in Wales, and then again uh, with Clermont with the Espoir team and the juniors, and then moving into a player coach role in Oyonnax in the Pro de Deux, then coaching uh, forwards uh, in the top 14, and then being a general manager in uh, in Provence last year in the Pro de Deux, um, but also occupying myself with the defensive structure of the of the team. So. A lot of experience, definitely in the defensive side and the forwards-based uh, rugby side of things. So um, you know, that's kind of a little bit of the history of, of where I'm coming from. And uh, I'm very happy, as I said earlier, to be back and uh, giving back to Rugby Canada so much uh, uh, as it's already given me uh, and the opportunities and be able to represent my country and continually doing that uh, this side uh, on the on the coaching side of things now. So. Um, you know, very happy to be uh, be a part of the uh, making uh, making rugby in Canada great again. If we can uh, take uh, take the uh, the slogan from our our meathead president from the from the south. So um so yeah so the principles of defense is the um, is the subject of this webinar. Um, I'll go through some different things uh, in terms of structures policies that we use here. Uh, with the pride, and then in turn with the national team. Um, for me, there's there's no real secrets in uh, in what we do. Um, you know, everybody tries new ideas, old ideas, uh, uh, current ideas to try and make a a good defensive uh, policy or structure for their team or for their club or for their you know mini rugby to professional team. It, it doesn't matter, but um. The key thing for me is uh, is making sure that everybody's on the same page and everything's very clear, and um, that everybody works together, which is for me pretty much the uh, the principle of of rugby. So um, I think maybe uh, I'll start with um, for me uh, defense. What is it? What is defense? Um, to me, I don't really like the term def defense because it's defending means to me it's like you're submitting I don't like submitting to anything I prefer to attack um, and I just I look at defense as attacking without the ball so we're attacking to get the ball back um, and using uh, our 
different uh, different policies through tackling, through jackling, through um, trying to uh, counter ruck to get the ball back, using uh, using those different uh, structures and policies to uh, to get the ball back, and then in turn win the ball uh, because uh, at the end of the day we need we need the ball to score more points in the opposition. Um, so if we can do that in a uh, an attacking mindset with the ball or without the ball, we can uh, we can be hopefully be successful. So I think maybe we can go from that to maybe just go through a little bit of our defensive structures with uh, with the pride, where I think I can uh, can show you my. Uh, so this is our um, this is the defensive structure for the pride. This is part of our playbook. Um, we've got a pretty in-depth playbook, but at the, at the end of the day, we try to keep it as simple as possible um, with different policies and um, and within our defensive structure. Um, the main one for us is obviously the, the tackle situation. Um, if we want to be uh, organized and uh, and attack teams to get the ball back. Um, things need to be obviously connected and cohesive and working together, but it all comes down to me is to that man on man or woman on woman contact is the uh, the tackling policies. If those are sound, we get players who are carrying the ball on the ground as fast as possible. We get a return to play that is very, very active and quick, and we'll have more defenders on their feet than attackers having a uh, a bigger number will then hopefully give us a better chance to um to dominate the tackle zone and to as i said earlier attack the ball carrier and win the ball back and uh and again be successful so the main thing that we talk about is chopping players ball carriers so our first tackler is, as you can see here with the this the tackling policy our first tackle will always chop low, aiming, aiming under the ball. It's a pretty good kind of line if you look at uh, somebody's elbows when they're carrying the ball. If you can chop in under those elbows, you're in the kind of upper quad to waist level of uh, of, of anybody uh, carrying the ball. And it's uh, the easiest place to, to bring them down to the ground. Um, the assistant tackler would be somebody coming most likely from the outside in. Um, as an assistant tackler and their job is to go on the ball stop the offload obviously drive the attacker back if the uh if the first chop was uh was effective and then uh once that player carrying the ball is on the ground there's that the rtp which is the return to play which is extremely important for us and for any uh for any team that wants to play quickly um, in my opinion modern rugby is a fast game where we build pressure and continue to do um, more and more actions again and again and again at a higher rate of speed and those teams that can continually do that are more often than not uh, very successful. Um, any type of jackal will obviously come from the inside. We don't attack from the outside in because then that'll create, uh, that'll contract your defensive line and if a good team get outside you, you'll be uh, losing uh, losing ground. and. Uh, Again, this last line here where it says, we bend but do not break. We're never out of the fight and we're always working from the inside to support our defensive line. That's meaning that those players that are in front of the ball are already under stress. And they need that help from the inside so that uh, they know that if they attack quickly and put pressure on the offense, a lot of times they'll step in. And that's where those inside guys or players really need to work hard so when those players do step in, they get chopped down. So that's kind of the, the simpler side of uh, our tackling policies here with the with the pride. And I think a lot of teams are probably very similar. Um, is there any questions there, Nathan, around that? Yeah, Jamie. Um, so I'm just gonna. We've had a lot of people join since uh, the introduction. So I just want to remind people if you have a question please type them out in your question box. We have a few already. Um, so one, a, a lot of them have to do with coaching um, 
the tactics that you're talking about. I don't know yeah. if you want to get into that a little later, but some of the questions are around how do you help players execute a low chop uh, tackle um, when defending, especially the pick and go in order to avoid uh, your no wrap or no attempted wrap. Um, and then why do we think we have less success as Canada when it comes to playing um, international teams of maybe a tier one nature in the tackle stats sheet when it comes to tackle completion rate and things like that? Um, well, there's, I think there's a few questions there. I'll, I'll address the, um, the, um, the pick and go and the, the non-wrap. Um, the key for most things in rugby for me is, uh, is body height. So if you're in and around the ruck and you've got, I'll, uh, I'll move down. If we're looking here at our, uh, do you see my uh, my mouse there? Nathan, can you see the mouse? Yes, sir. Okay, so if we're looking at our around the ruck area here where this, this X signifies a ruck, where we have our rock, our two and our three around the, on the open side of the ruck. If we're looking in a pick and go type situation, these two players are most likely going to be involved. And then the negative rock, which will come around the ruck, will probably be involved as well. So the key around here to stop a pick and go type thing is one, having your outside leg up so that your first step forward is your inside leg and you're driving that player back into the ruck where they came from. Um, and two is just being low, having a lower body position. It's, um, it's just like in a ruck. It's all about the, the battle of the shoulder height. So if you've got lower shoulders than them, majority of the time you're going to uh, you're going to win the collision and making sure that you get that impetus, taking a good meter, meter and a half off the ruck, and then a good 20 to 30 centimeters behind that last foot, so that you can get that impetus and that uh, that momentum to drive uh, that that player picking and going back into uh, to the ruck to where they came from. Um, speaking on the second, yes, yeah, sorry. Real quick, if you don't mind, we've had a few, as you've answered, a few questions jump in about your definition yep. of um, players around the ruck. So what is a rock and okay. what are you expecting those players to do? Okay, so if you uh, if you look here on this defense policy around the, the ruck, we have our verbiage is the rock, the R, the negative rock is the negative, uh, the negative R here. And then your two player, and your three player are, for me, your these four players are the most important uh, people around the ruck. You create that hermetic seal here. You can do, you can deal with a lot of other stuff out here as long as these guys go forward and stay square. So a lot of people have different names for it. One, two, three, A, B, C, the pillar, uh, the plug. We use rock two, three, just because it kind of rolls off the tongue a bit easier. Uh, for when guys are under stress and the different roles here are rock as soon as the ball is played he goes forward he doesn't slide out two has to stay connected with the with the rock of course and he needs to move forward as well the three as well moving forward but not getting ahead of his inside man as as we all uh, talk about a lot with our players you never get ahead of the ball so if the ball comes to one of these players, clearly the rock and two will deal with them. The negative rock will come around the rock, trust in the rock and two making their tackle, and he'll become the new rock on this side. So that's kind of the, the verbiage and the, the roles for those people that are around the rock. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Jamie. Okay, so after that, you know, there's many different scenarios, but um, the key for me is is if you can lock down this ruck area, that again helps these guys out here. So if these guys all move up and stay square, there's not too much space or options for these guys besides going into contact well behind the advantage line. So it's important that from the beginning, having a ruck, getting your rocks in place, having them nominate, have good spacing, eyes up, staying square, not turning their shoulders too early, and them really pushing up hard 
that helps all the other players move up. So you've got this ball leaving from here to these players, the rock, the two, and the three will move up square. The negative rock will come around to fill the, fill the gap. The minus two, the minus three will build their space. So we've got a new line right across this area and we've already won two, three, maybe even four meters if we get a really good uh, hit on our, our defensive line moving up. All good? Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, the primary sets of questions coming in now are related to your um, flexibility in your policy, depending on where you are on the field and um, you know what the priorities are, what maybe the situation in the game is. And so I'm, I'll, I'll leave that to you to see when you might want to fit that in, because you might be getting to different pieces of it a little later on. Yeah, well, <clears throat> defensive systems are, they're not set in stone. Um, it's, as I alluded to earlier, it's, we have a principle of bending but not breaking. So, you know, there's different situations where you can blitz. Uh, for example, when you have a, a rock on the, uh, in the, in the 15 meter channel where you can really get up and get after teams and really try to drive them back, uh, back inside. And then we can really go after the ball. Definitely more different when you have a ruck such as this, midfield ruck, where you know it's a, it's a difficult ruck to defend. It's a difficult ruck to have a, a really fast defensive push or a blitz type defense. You might have to be in a bit more of a control or a, or a jockey type uh, situation until you can get that, uh, that ruck on the outside channels and really come up and go after them. Um, so for me, there's nothing set in stone. Um, these structures are more for finding your way when you get lost or just knowing where you need to be uh, when you're in certain situations. So clearly this is, uh, this is not a every day, sorry, an every moment uh, situation. This is, you know, the perfect scenario on a computer with a bunch of little white and blue men. But, um, you know, as you work more and more as a team about staying connected, uh, working together and communicating, which is the biggest thing in defense. If you don't have communication, it's very, very difficult to have 15 people working in unison on the field together. That's great. Actually, you um, lead me to a, a really good question here around uh, two things. One is how do you have players adapt when the first few tackles are soft or negative tackles or missed tackles even in terms of getting back into that structure? Uh, yeah. And the second one might be around the folding specifically um, around the tackle ruck. Um, is it only the negatives that fold around um, or at what point do you need maybe change up who is doing some of that uh, moving around uh, on the fold? Okay. So if you get into a, a soft tackle situation, or, or I like to call soaking, um, you obviously never want to be in that type of situation, but unfortunately it happens uh, through many different factors. Um, one drill that we do is we look at a, a green, a yellow, or a red ruck. Um, so it's a little easy drill where you can have, um, you know, different colored cones for this, uh, this green, yellow, or red ruck. Um, and the players need to make a decision as to where they are on the field and how are they coming to this ruck. So if it's a green ruck, that means we're going forward. We've had a dominant tackle um, and you know we're, we're on the front foot. Whereas a yellow ruck maybe is a neutral ruck where we maybe lost a meter or two. And then a red ruck, it means we've been broken. We might have been, the, the nines maybe made his tackle in the, uh, in the second level of the defense. And we've all had to work hard to get back. Um, and this was a, would be a ruck that clearly we wouldn't contest. We wouldn't go after the ball. We'd just try to regain our line, regain our cohesion, so that we can again hopefully get the, get on the front foot again. So, you know, there's uh, there's some good drills um, that uh, you know I can I can share with with uh, with you all um, through uh, through through email. If anybody has any questions on that um, around around the kind of different structure of uh, of training for those type of things, 
But um, the biggest thing for me is, uh, you know, these, again, these structures are to find your way when you're lost. So if you maybe have three or four soaking uh, tackles, you've missed one or two, you've lost 10, 15, 20 meters. Well, you've got to get that structure back together. You've got to get that rock two, three on the rocks. And then everybody else can kind of find their place out of that. And then again, come up and push and, uh, and try to attack the ball. Great, thanks, Jamie. Uh, there's a lot of very technical questions, Jamie, around uh, specific players and positions. Uh, maybe you want to move into your next kind of component here, and we'll try and and um, you know see if we can place some of those questions in there. Okay, okay. So, sorry, I've just got to move this around here. So, in terms of where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? So in terms of, um, you know, after ruck, after uh, line out, after scrum type of policies, um, we don't have too many. It's more about eyes up, looking at what uh, what's in front of you. Um, clearly, if you have a, a five-man line out, you're not going to be folding three or four people around the corner um, because that'll completely unbalance your defense. Um, a big key for me is uh for for a lot of teams is to look at where your 10 is when that first phase uh de defensive play is made so if your 10's in the tackle most likely you're going to have to fold two if not three um if your 10's not in the tackle then you know guys need to look up and see uh see where the threats are and just get on their feet and get uh, get in place early is uh, one thing that um, I'll bring it back to the beginning here when we talked about defensive structures. If we want to play fast, you have to be in place first. So that return to play is very, very important. Um, it's, for me, it's the, it's the biggest thing. We work on uh, just simple things a lot with the pride, just timing on how fast guys get up from their front, from their back, from being in the bottom of a, a rock or a mall because um, that's extremely important. If we have 14, 15 players on their feet, well, we have a we have a numerical advantage if we can go after teams. So it's very, very important in terms of uh, having a good defensive, cohesive line, um, having people on their feet and having people be connected. Jamie, uh, just with that in mind, um, when you look at the structure itself, um, how do you feel the structure uh, enables you to win that ball back from a technical perspective? Is it when you create or or have that positive tackle, so your green rucks, is that where you look for turnover? Is it uh, through pressure and having players, uh, or sorry, the opposition decide to kick the ball away, for instance, depending on where they are in the field? How do you look at the structure in terms of helping you get the ball back? Yeah, so... That'd be a um, that'd be one for uh, different policies for different games. So we have a, a a call called fire, where if we have a ruck here in the uh, in the 15 meter channel, in a, like as we've seen here, if we get a positive tackle or we get a, a a good chop tackle where we can go after the ball, we'll have a fire call where a lot of times teams. Uh, don't secure their rucks as well as 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 they should in the 50 meter channel. So we can sometimes go go after those, um, and that would mean uh, we call a fire. So it would be first tackler in, second, third man will uh, will counter ruck and try to uh, to win the ball that way. Um, other times there's ways where we'll just leave the ball alone and uh, we'll only go after the third ruck, or maybe go only go after the the fifth ruck. Or when certain people are carrying the ball, we'll, we'll only go after those rocks. So it really comes down to um, you know the strategy that you've decided as a team uh, as to who you want to, uh, how you want to get the ball back, uh, and and where really. You know we have um, some other policies where I'll go to um, our defensive. I'll go to a defensive plan where 
This is our, our last plan against uh, Burnaby Lake, or as you can see, um, in, the, in, the, in their 22, we wanted to stay cool. So there was no contest in the 22. Um, here in the 15 meter channels, we've got fire is on. And then in our last 22, we wanted nobody to score. So we wanted to be fired up and obviously no go zone. There was different, different um, you know, things, little themes. So a return to play, chopping their heavy, heavy carriers, which is obviously very important and it's part of our system making sure our rock two threes are, uh, are in place quickly, Connect, scanning and connecting in, in outside channels as we knew they would, they would try to pick and go and then exploit our 13, 14 uh, um, gap or 11 with, uh, with their outside, uh, outside runners, their 13 and, and wing, who were quite strong runners. So we're making sure we wanted to connect in those outside channels. Um, okay. And then that line speed going after them. Jamie, sorry, real quick. I think the slide we see is your classic defensive photo slide. So I'm not sure if you had another one there with that. Uh, yes, I've been. Uh, I didn't keep up with uh, showing everything. <laughs> Hold on. There we go. You guys seeing that? No, we're still seeing just that classic defensive photo. So your mouse cursor is stuck at the top there. There, there we go. We go. I just had to stop and re reset it. So here, here we're. Sorry, I'll, I'll take you back. So here we've. Uh, this was our defensive plan for our, our last game against Burnaby, where we wanted to stay cool in uh, in their zone, not let them get out of their own end uh, with any easy penalties. Um, so really, just chopping, getting on our feet, and basically putting pressure on them enough so that hopefully they can kick it back. Um, as uh, as I'm sure a lot of people have heard, but you know the the numbers around 50% in terms of uh, you know teams kicking the ball away and creating chaos, and that's where you can score. Um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the scoring opportunities come from uh, you know errant kicks, kicks that don't find touch, or kicks that are you know on the touchline and can be replayed, and then uh, you can find that kind of destabilizing uh, counterattack and uh, really get a lot of good out of it. So looking at, uh, at our defensive plan here, we wanted to stay cool in the 22. The 15 meter channels were, uh, were open to fire. Um, and then uh, obviously we wanted to stop in anything in, uh, in our 22. We uh, unfortunately didn't do very well in that game, but uh, we were very, very lucky to just squeak it out at the end. Great. Um, uh, one of the questions that's really coming up is, um, and especially in a variety of these situations, is where is the nine? Do you have a particular philosophy around the nine, um, or is there a particular role for them to play overall or in various scenarios? The nine for me would be in the second level, second level of the defense. So um, <clears throat> I maybe come back to uh, to here. Um, here's here's our nine. He's in the uh, he's in the R two. You know, as, as as or or L two, level two, whatever however you want to call it. So you've got level one, which is our connected defensive line. Our L two, which is our level two with the nine, who's orchestrating these boys around the rock, making sure you might have to fill in if somebody gets into place quickly or uh, slowly. Um, and then we've got our our wingers and fullback working on a pendulum in our L three. So. We've got the frontline guys, the nine orchestrating with help from our wingers and our fullback, always communicating the different threats that they see uh, from the backfield. Okay, great. Um, I think um, one of the other questions is around um, where it is that, um, that uh, you want to defend the mall so how is it that we set up mall defense specifically identifying it as you know potentially a, a, a weakness that we might have in general in the game in Canada yeah um, well the key uh, in um, in breaking up any mall is timing and uh, and violence um, for us at the pride we uh, we don't sack we only well we do sack sorry we we only sack in the first at the five to seven meters of the lineup in the first basically pod where we will peel apart the front lifter creating space for that jumper who has sat down in that hole 
and then the next two defenders will uh, will drive into that um, into those remaining players and hopefully get them into the ground. Um, after uh, after that, further back into the lineup, we um, actually maybe work it on here, where if we have a if we have a lineup set up here with these three players, they need to be they need to be ripped apart, put on the ground, and everything else coming through here needs to be uh, very, very low. So the key for me in um, any mall defense is obviously shoulder height, being lower than the opposition. And when you come out the back of the mall, you have to take two or three people with you. Um, you can't try to stop a, uh, a driving, a good, um, a well-structured driving mall if you don't peel put people out and you don't make the mall smaller. Um, teams that stay well together and stay very, very cohesive and stay straight and low are very, very difficult to stop. So if you can't rip that apart and you can't peel those pieces off of that mall, uh, well, you're, you're not gonna have any success with stopping it. So it's, it's something that needs to be worked on, but the key is, as I said, when you come out the back of the mall, make sure you're coming with two or three people and, uh, and you'll be successful more often than not. Great, thanks, Jamie. Uh, a lot of the questions coming up are uh, in relation to the training environment. So um, I don't know if there's anything other uh, technical that you kind of wanted to go through when it came to uh, the actual system or your philosophy around the system. But um, a lot of questions are moving into that training environment, and there's a there's some questions about how you instill this. So did, is there anything first, though, from a technical perspective that you wanted to touch on? Um, I think we've touched on most, you know, the, if we go back to the first, um, our first slide here with the ta tackling policies and our defensive policies around the rock, um, those obviously go more in depth when we talk to the team as a whole because, you know, everybody has different roles, whether it's, you know, in the scrum, in the back line, in the, in the level three with our, with our pendulum wingers and, and fullback moving uh, and and uh, and correlating themselves and their movement together to make sure we don't get destabilized. Um, and then uh, you know, everybody has a role to play depending on where they are and, and uh, where uh, where we are as well. So in terms of the policies and uh, and and our structure, it's it's very very simple. You know, as uh, as I've said here, you know, we've got everybody around the rock. We've got our, our negative and our positive uh, numbers with our centers and our wings. Um, and the key is uh, obviously everybody stays square. Nobody turns their shoulders too soon. Um, we keep working together and working from the inside. And those things are, uh, are really the, the kind of the most important things for any defensive line. You stay together and you work and you, uh, and you keep uh, pushing from the inside and you keep uh, Communicating that, well, uh, I think you'd be very, very, uh, very, very successful uh, more often than not. Okay, great. Um, uh, there's a lot here around uh, culture within the team on the defensive end. So um, what are the, some of the things you do to help create a defensive culture with buy-in from the players, especially at the club level where you know you might have, you know, some weak links? Yeah, well, um, you know, the, the key is, um, is honesty. Um, there's there's three three main things that that, that we work on here are uh, hard work, honesty, and humility. These are they're very sim simple things, but they're very very hard to have throughout the whole team. Um, if you ask those hard questions to everybody, is everybody practicing these three things all the time? Um, and if you can have those honest, open com conversations with your group, whatever they may be, um, then you know you can you can do really, really well. But if you've got a few who are maybe hiding out or pointing fingers or you know not ad adhering to you know the structure that you've put in place, and they don't want to work for the work from the inside, they don't want to work for their teammates. Well, you know maybe they're in the wrong sport. So it's really, really important. You can keep things really, really simple. Have a structure that people understand that it's simple. It doesn't need to be, you know, 
overlapping and okay this is where we're going to blitz and this is where we're going to control if you just keep everybody connected and working hard for each each other then i think it's pretty easy to have a buy-in because you'll be successful with that um you don't need to make anything kind of you know world beating or this is how so and so does it look at where your strengths are in your team and try and work around that and really work with your leaders to help them transmit that message as well because if a lot of the ideas are coming from the players and that correlates with the structure that you put in place well you're going to get a greater buy-in to that dis defensive plan because it's not just coming from the top down if it's too directive um you know there's there's no collaboration and you know, rugby's a team the coach is a, is a part of that team he's at the head of it but he still needs to be humble enough so that he can take on uh, ideas from uh, from the rest of the squad and make sure that everybody has that buy-in so it's it's a it's a bit of give and take um, and to make sure that everybody is on the same page um, but uh, if you don't have these three things it's going to be very very difficult to uh, to go uh, to go very far great thanks so um, moving into some more specific pieces around um, uh, training sessions What's your thoughts on um, contact versus non-contact training of the defensive structure and uh, how much contact would you want to see in a week or in a, in a, in a cycle or a season uh, of your you know, defensive structure itself? Yeah, um, well, contact is, is very important, obviously, because we play a contact game. So you can't have, obviously, too much. And you can't have not enough so it's um it's a, it's a difficult question um you have to look at the i think first you need to look at what team you're working with um i'm very fortunate as i have uh, basically a professional setup where we're seven days a week and we have our players on load management and um you know we've got physio and we've got you know everything that we need as any professional team so we can uh, we can go pretty hard. You know, we go hard on Tuesdays. We go we sometimes go hard on Thursdays as well. Um, next year we'll be getting we'll be going hard a little bit less on a Thursday, but a little bit harder on a Friday, um, just to kind of get that testosterone spike towards the end of the week, preparing for a Saturday. Um, it's um, the key for me is that if you're going to do contact, it needs to be intense and it needs to be fast. So basically like a game like situation it doesn't have to be long you can do two halves of six minutes you can do two halves of eight minutes you can even do as little as four minutes two 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 minute bouts depending on um you know who, who you're working with but i do believe that it's very very difficult very very important and difficult to not have any in the week and then expect to be uh, good on the weekend um we do a lot of progressive stuff where we work on a lot of like really, really small, um, tiny uh, technical uh, um, drills where there's no real distance, there's no real speed. It's about shoulder con shoulder uh, height, making sure guys are in the right places, their heads are up, they're in the good position, shoulder contact with a good wrap on the ground, on their feet right afterwards. Um, and then we'll progress that further on throughout the training session into something that is like, like a game. Well, we, uh, we maybe play on some short-sided games or, you know, 15 on 15 or some drop-off touch or stuff like that. I know there's a, there's a drop-off touch that we play uh, pro speed, full contact that uh, my boys love. Um, and even though they're probably, probably laughing about it now if they're, if they're watching, but um, you know, those type of games are, are really good in terms of uh, it does helps you physically helps um, create a good culture around the defense because, you know, you, when you go through hell uh, together, uh, guys get bonded and, uh, and they, and they feel pretty, pretty confident uh, working together after stuff like that. So, um, you know, I think, you can't have too much, you can't have too little. You just got to find that kind of happy medium. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if it's a club team uh, and you're working uh, a Tuesday, Thursday with a Saturday game, I think you should probably do a bit of contact Tuesday and Thursday. 
Um, you know, it doesn't have to be long, but it has to be intense and it has to have purpose and it has to make things, uh, make, you know, it has to be coherent in terms of making, uh, making your team better. Uh, I think that's great. I think um, it, it kind of uh, ties into, again, at the club level, a lot of the questions are uh, focusing on a games-based approach, which you referenced, whether it's contact or non-contact. Is there any other examples of a games-based approach you take when working on either your structure or some of the technical aspects of, of your defense, i.e. I. tackling, right? Uh, yeah. what, what might be a games-based approach to addressing those? So a games-based approach would be uh, something that we use a lot of. We call it load ball, which is 15 on 15. Um, and we use different uh, rules or kind of you know, tactics within that where we may have, you know, we may have supermen in our team. We may have uh, some replays. We may have some guys who are, are only allowed to pass but not allowed to tackle and many different things like that, but it's basically just touch rugby and you can kind of put the put the intensity levels where you want it to be. So is it, okay, shoulder on tackle and everybody goes to the ground or is it two hand touch and then there has to be two defenders in and three attackers, you know, ball carrier plus two, like a normal rock. Um, you know, there's many different rules that you can put in to kind of get the the outcome that you'd like. Um, depends really on what you're working on. So if it's defensive stuff and you want to, you know, G the boys up, well, you put lower numbers on attack and you've got higher numbers on defense and, you know, they can, they can really, you know, get up, get excited, win ground, go after the ball, get a turnover, and then boom, let them play the turnover. Um, so it really depends on the theme that you're working on that day. Um, but there's uh, there's a lot of different games. So the low ball for me is is the one that we use a lot, which is just 15 on 15. Um, you know, when you're touched with two hands, you have to go to the ground and create a rock. Um, shoulder height is very very important. So if the defense defender uh, has shoulders that are too high, um, there can be penalties. Make them go do burpees or run up the stadium or whatever it may be. Um, but um, you know, there's little kind of uh, rules that you can put in place to uh, get those different outcomes. Great. And that leads into some of the a couple of technical pieces around the tackle itself. Um, what are some things you do to uh, coach the tackle uh, yeah. from the tackler's perspective, um, yeah. knowing that you have to win that shoulder battle? And the yeah. second one is specifically when the ball carriers, notably in, in tight situations, go really low. Uh, yeah. What are some of the techniques you use to coach uh, tacklers uh, in those positions? Yeah, well, um, the biggest thing we work on is uh, is just making sure that you've got, you know, the right foot, right shoulder, um, you know, left foot, left shoulder, making sure that you're you're low and you're in place with your head up and you're not kind of, you're not diving into tackles because, you know, you know, if, if you can all see me here, I look like an eagle. Eagles can't tackle anything. But I tell you what can tackle something is boxers. If boxers aren't going to hit you with, I'm not going to hit you with my fists, well, anymore, because, you know, I don't play rugby anymore. But what I am going to do is I'm going to hit you with my shoulder. So you got to get low, head up, and really work on getting those shoulders in uh, and getting that contact. So the, the big, big thing we work on is just making sure that guys have good shoulder, good feet, sort of good feet, good shoulder, and, uh, and making sure that naturally will have the head on the right side so you can uh, – get in and, uh, and take the, the ball carrier to the ground. Around the ruck, um, it's again, just getting low. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's very difficult to get into uh, somebody's waist level when they're picking and going around the ruck. But um, you know, you can get shoulder on shoulder, you can get shoulder on the back, you can get shoulder on, unfortunately you'll get shoulder on head because you, you can't avoid it in that type of situation. But the key is obviously shoulder contact, wrapping it up and uh, leg drive to, to drive them back. So. Um, you know, we do a lot of work on just really like one-on-one -on -one stuff where we're in a, sm a closed environment. We just work on making sure the player reacts properly to get his shoulders and feet, more importantly, in the, in the right places. And then kind of progressively work, work it up into more speed, into more, uh, more contact, more intensity uh, so that uh, the guys can be, uh, 
can perform on the on the field on the weekend. Okay, great. I've got one more kind of really general question here um, around um, the age grade level. So for those who are introductory to rugby, going into some of the foundations that you would want to see from these players, how would you look to scaffold uh, your defensive structure and some of the technical aspects of of defense? Um, yeah. from, you know, a beginner rugby player through to when you would like to see them in the Pride program. Yeah, so, um, you know, if we go all the way back to, say, mini rugby, you know, five, sorry, six, seven years old, um, like my boy, you started started at six last year. Um, obviously, the key is, uh, is kids at that age, you need to just learn how to fall. They need to learn how to run. Um, and it's introductory, you know, to, to, to contact. Um, as long as they have a mouth guard and they're working on technic, technique, um, I think that's really, really, uh, really, really important. Um, kids need to learn that technique first with, and take the speed out of it. There doesn't need to be any speed. You know, you see kids learning how to, to tackle. They, they're on their knees. They learn how to fall. They learn how to present the ball. Um, you know, those are those kind of fundamental things that everybody learns as a kid. You, know, you need to learn how to run around. You need to learn how to catch, how to pass. Um, you need to learn, learn how to ride your bike, um, you know, because falling off your bike is about is about 10 times more dangerous than playing rugby, definitely tackle rugby. So, um, you know, making sure that you just take the speed out of things and, uh, and kids work on, uh, on just being accustomed to being in contact. Um, because, uh, you know, at that age, you know, there's so much that they're learning in there and they're probably not quite ready to, to use their bodies. They're still quite young. Um, so the key is just, you know, being comfortable in those situations and uh, and learning that technique and then that'll just slowly build and uh, as you go through the different age grades to uh, to always work on that technical stuff you know catch pass is just as important as uh, as as tackling because uh, it's um, it's you know it's one of those fundamental things of the game that, that are needed so um, you know for me little technical blocks always need to be touched on throughout the, any any player's career you know even when you're when i was playing pro we we'd always work on little one-on-one -on -one tackling drills after trainings um you know two-on-one stuff uh, just trying to get better trying to get more uh more uh, precise in the in the tackle zone Okay, great. Um, coming back to some of the more nuanced um, pieces around the defensive structure itself, Jamie, uh, there's a lot of questions around your uh, philosophy around, uh, uh, pol or sorry, policies around kick defense. Yep. So is there anything that you particularly want to see or look to see? Um, so kick defense, uh, if we're looking at uh, say a box kick or uh, a clearance kick, um, we're we're going to put a lot of pressure on that. Um, our idea um, in any type of kick defense is attacking the foot, so we're not going to be diving with our hands in the air to try and block a kick. We're going to be diving with our hands out in a diving motion, as if you were uh, going to dive into the into the swimming pool, and uh, really attacking where the foot's going to be. Um, so for us, that's the biggest start of the kick defense. Um, then after that, it, it comes down to uh, those guys in in in, uh, in level two and level three in the in the backfield to uh, to properly uh, prepare themselves and be in the in the in the right position to uh, to receive that kick and then uh, then again uh, counter attack. Okay, great. And then uh, uh, anything in particular in the setup as the kick is coming? So to transition from, um, you know, that defense into attack, I guess. Yeah, so if we're looking at like just a, a normal catch, uh, clear, we want to have players going up and catching the ball above their head if possible. If not, you know, keeping their elbows together and really going after the ball um, in terms of a kick, uh, kick receipt. Um, those kind of little skills are, are things that, uh, that, you know, you can work on whenever, whenever you have a bit of time and space, you know, playing with your brother in the backyard or your sister or, uh, 
or going down to the local field and just kicking the ball around, those type of like small skills, those micro skills are really, really important in, in creating a, a good uh, good skill set for uh, for any rugby player. And that's that's for anybody. That's for props, that's for second rows, that's for back rows, that's for uh, one to 15. Everybody knows how to catch, needs to know how to catch the ball above their head, needs to know how to catch a ball jumping up in the air. Um, all those little micro skills are extremely important to, uh, Know, fulfilling your potential. Okay, great. We've only, uh, well, I mean, we've got just under 10 minutes. Jamie, is there anything in your presentation from, a, again, a, a, um, sorry, a structure perspective or a principles perspective that you really wanted to touch on that we haven't had a chance yet? Um, no, I don't think so. I think we've, uh, you know, things are, you know, this is all we, we, we work on our calls, work on our structure. And we work on our policy around the ruck. Clearly, we go into a little bit more depth, and we have everybody involved, and you know, with video and uh, and looking at the um, the different attacks that will uh, will come up against it with other teams. But as I said at the beginning, I alluded to how important it is to keep things simple. Um, if you keep things simple. When you're out on the field, you have to always remember when you're out on the field, you're 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 blown out your ass, you're you're tired, you're under stress. Um, you might have just come out of a scrum or you might have just come out of a of a tackle situation. Um, that's extremely important that all this stuff is is easy to remember and easy to assimilate because when you're under that stress, you can't worry about you're never gonna remember those technical things. You're gonna remember those big block elements. So, you know, if you've got easy rules around the ruck, everybody goes through those different, uh, those different um, structures a lot because obviously re repetition is uh, extremely important in learning all these type, of, uh, these type of structures and policies. Um, and then uh, just out, getting out there and playing, you know, playing, uh, playing on the defensive side, playing on the offensive side, making it fun because at the end of the day, if it's not fun, you're, you're not going to be – you know, you're not going to be very interested in, in learning any of these things. So, um, you know, keep the ball alive and making sure that, you know, the attack is as fun as the defense, you know, maybe making, uh, as a coach, giving uh, giving different, um, you know, um, rewards uh, for defensive teams, you know, giving them little, you know, you can have the tackler of the day, a T-shirt or, uh, you know, getting an extra, an extra, candy bar or something at the end of training and stuff like that you know just keep it fun for the kids um and even even for my guys and then even at the national level guys are having a bit of fun uh, and having a laugh while working hard uh then you're in a you're in a good environment and uh people are going to do the do the extra extra effort Great. Um, any chance, JB, you want to walk into any of your calls in terms of um, where it is um, and what you need to see in order for a particular defensive call to come into into mind, whether it's hot, cold, etc.? Yeah. Um, well, we don't have that stuff down on uh, down on paper. I don't have that as part of our our game plan because you know that's it's. I don't think that needs to be part of a game plan. That needs to be around the the feeling of the of the players at the moment. Um, but uh, you know, we definitely have those uh, those fire calls as I uh, as I showed in the um, in the other uh, the other slide here. There we go. So um, you know these these different um, these different um, calls where you know we work through the different games and you know okay do we have a positive rock here in the 15 can I fire it well sure let's go for it um, are we gonna blitz in the middle of the field for this game well this game no we're not because that's that was the the policy that was decided from our uh, from our defensive uh, defensive group so. You know, in terms of calls, in terms of like blitz defense or or jockey defense, um, that really comes down to um, you know the moment and playing what's in front of you. So you know, if you can get a lot of games in your trainings throughout the week, um, your players will start to recognize that, and uh, and you'll start to see it on the field uh, on the weekend because they've they've been training it. You know, if you train those things, you repeat it enough times and it comes ingrained in uh, in your players. Well, um, 
know, you, uh, you'll hopefully have uh, more success on the weekend. Okay, great. We've got a couple um, minutes, Jamie. Before I wrap up, I'm just gonna fire over a couple more. Um, yeah. Uh, especially when it comes to your analysis of defense, what are some of the key stats, either individually or as a team, do you look for, and uh, how do you get players to buy into addressing them? So, in terms of uh, stats, you know, we look at making sure that um, you know our tackle stats are uh, above ninety percent. Um, it's a, it's a pretty high number, and it's it's difficult to do so. But um, you know, if we work together, and the guys really. Uh, concentrate on on staying connected and and chopping guys down and not soaking uh players uh on attack well we can normally stay in the high 80s to low 90s in terms of tackle completion and tackle percentage um that's kind of the the holy grail it's what we're looking for um you know well over 90 a lot of times you'll be uh, you'll be in a good position to uh to win games you know over 90 percent tackling under 10 penalties per game you're, you'd be in it to win it if you uh, if you can score a few points so in terms of kind of uh numbers and stats and stuff that we're looking at obviously we want to have a good tackle completion rate um maybe a few fires in a game you know meaning we're we're counter rocking we're we're recuperating ball getting some turnovers um and then uh making sure that obviously the team doesn't score as many points as as, as we do and uh hopefully we can uh, come out with a win at the end of the day right um and then when it comes to the tackle a lot of questions here around the, the mindset uh so specifically you what was your mindset going into tackles and what have you taken from that to try and instill on your on your team now well um my uh, my mindset was um i always wanted to dominate uh i found uh that as a, a big um big kind of uh reference point for myself where um if uh i had uh dominated the majority of my tackles um i could i could be a performer in uh, in in my role on the team um it was important that was kind of that was my role if, if i made 10 good tackles and 10 good carries i i know i had done uh, i had done a, a a good a good job for me as my part and uh, i could uh, help help the team win so you know i wasn't too worried about scoring tries unfortunately um i was more import i was more uh, focused on uh, cutting people in half um maybe it's probably not the right uh, the right the right wording these days but um, <laughs> that's uh that was that was my mindset um you know i found uh, i worked with actually a sports psychologist later on in life who said uh, um you can you can punch whoever you want on the field and i said what what do you mean i i'm a, a well yeah i know i can do that but i'm you know then i get a yellow card or a red card or whoever and he and he said no 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 if you do those 10 tackles and if you do those 10 carries you'll find that you'll be so busy working on getting those 20 tasks done that the game will be over and you would have had a really good game you wouldn't have had time to worry about all the peripheral kind of bull crap um and that really kind of resonated and hit home with me so you know in terms of that and trying to instill it on my guys um you know we we have some good open co honest conversations on you know what what we want as a team and what we want to uh what we want to excel at and i think uh you know for my guys they're they're very proud uh proud guys they're, they're they're good rugby players and very very proud and they want to they want to succeed and they want to they want to play rugby at a, at a good level and uh, i think that's enough for 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 them to uh to adhere to that defensive system and to, and to be uh and to to perform in that in that system so you know if you can uh, if you can find a if you can get a group together that uh, that does that, that asks those hard questions and is honest with each other, um, then you can uh, you can do you can go very very far because uh, you know 15 people pulling in the same direction is uh, is extremely powerful um, and uh, you know it's uh, it's pretty much as it's as simple as that. 
Okay. Great, Jamie. It's uh, seven o'clock here now. Um, I, I do know that uh, unfortunately we just haven't gotten to all the questions. So before I wrap up, Jamie, is there anything else you want to um, say to our rugby public um, before we uh, end tonight's webinar? Uh, no, I'd just like to say uh, thanks uh, to everybody to coming out and listen. Uh, I hope uh, everybody uh, learned something uh, or, uh, you know, maybe think about think about the game a little bit differently so that um. You know, a lot, I know there's a lot of coaches and, uh, and and people involved in rugby in Canada that are um, that are working extremely hard, and I and I appreciate what you do. You know, we're we're trying to do the same thing here. Um, it's important that we all stay positive and uh, and obviously safe right now in the in the in the in the different cl in the climate that we're in right now. But uh, in terms of rugby, you know, make sure to keep it fun. Um, keep uh keep your players playing uh as as much as you can you never want to be talking too much you never want to be you know pulling guys in screaming at guys you know it's it's about you know running the ball around and tackling and scoring tries and and having fun at the end of the day so um you know the more that we do that the more we're going to have a strong game in canada and we're, the more we're going to have uh you know more kids girls and boys playing at, at a high level um and uh you know that's uh that's pretty that's pretty much it for me outstanding all right so i just want to say a quick thank you once again to jamie cudmore for taking the time today to join us and uh, uh provide us with some of his wisdom on defensive tactics and principles um just a reminder we do have a webinar upcoming on thursday at 3 p.m pacific 6 p.m Eastern time with John Tate looking at skill acquisition. Um, and then next Tuesday, Jamie uh, Cudmore will again be doing his presentation in French. Again, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, and there will be a different moderator. So people won't need to listen to me uh, ramble on over and over again. On behalf of Rugby Canada, uh, we also, sorry, just want to send a quick reminder that there is a suspension of rugby activities at the moment, and we will be updating the rugby public soon. But please, in the meantime, stay safe, follow your provincial uh, regulations or rules around your social distancing, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again, uh, again shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.